Welcome to the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev, where we explore and share experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week from across the games industry, helping you make the best game you can. Stay tuned for today's episode. Good morning, Overload Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Daily Dev Talk, talking to game developers from across the world to bring you experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week. Today, I'm joined with Frederick Denning, from Beta Dwarfs to talk about his game, Forced Eternal Arenas. But Frederick, please talk about yourself first and how you got into the games industry. Yeah, well, I always loved playing games, basically, and always played around with editing games from back when I was a child. <clears throat> so I was studying philosophy uh, a lot of years ago now, and then uh, somebody told me that you could actually study game design, and I was just immediately hooked. It, had, it has always been this sort of obscure uh, business to me, where you sort of had to know someone to start making games. And I, and I realized that you could actually get into it uh, simply by studying or, or pursuing games uh, in different ways. So I did that, and I started working in uh, different small teams, and I joined Beta Dwarf seven months ago now. Um, so that's basically how I got into uh, the games industry. I haven't been here for, for that long. Yes, it's one of those kind of industries where it's um, it, it's uh, sometimes it's who you know as opposed to what you know. Yeah, that's definitely true. I also think that's um, that makes sense uh, somehow because the games industry, it's... Not necessarily all about uh, like theory and 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 stuff like that. It's it's more about actually fitting into a certain team. So I know that from Beta Dwarf that we sometimes take people in that are not necessarily the most experienced people. But if we find that they fit our team very well in the atmosphere in the team, that's uh, that's a huge deal for us. That's great to hear. So, speaking of the team, tell me about it. How many people are there? What's the structure? And uh, what's the workflow? So, Bizetorf works with a really flat hierarchy. Uh, we are about 18 people right now. It's fluctuating uh, a lot because we are always uh, offering internships, so we always have a lot of new people coming and going. Um, but the core team right now consists of 12 people called Dwarves, which are sort of the core team that are hired uh, for life, basically. And then we have some contract workers and some interns. All in all, we are 18 people right now. And I think that one of the more interesting things about Beta Dwarf in a structural way is that we have a lot of resources in design and art. Usually you'll see a lot of game cup resources dedicated to programmers because that's obviously a very important uh, <clears throat> important area in games development. But we only recently went from three programmers to four programmers on a team of almost 20. And that's because we use a lot of uh, visual scripting. So... Our designers are very independent, and that means that when we set out to create new features, our designers can, uh, f for the most part, often actually just implement these features themselves, and that gives us a very creative and agile work environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's great to know. Often there tends to be a more of a priority on programmers. There tends to be more of them as opposed to uh, art. So tell me uh, about um, Forced Eternal Arenas. Uh, what was the starting point of the game? Did you totally start from scratch or did you grab an engine and go? What was what was phase one? Phase one was that the team had developed the first game, Forced, which was very heavily focused on co-op and was a really great co-op experience for up to four players. And <clears throat> after doing that, the team wanted to take the new game in a direction that was more focused on a solid single-player experience. And it started out way back as something that should have 
we knew that it, we wanted it to have procedurally generated uh, content, and we basically started out with this idea of generating arenas that the user had to fight through. And then as the concept has evolved, um, we pretty early early on figured out that we wanted cart, uh, cards in the game as a core mechanic. We found that uh, a lot of stuff is happening to card games these days, and we found that it would be an, an interesting mechanic sort of to put on uh, an action game, because that's not something you've seen a lot, but we think that it's uh, a pretty interesting way of diverging a bit from the traditional RPG level up ways of doing things and instead um, focus on the user being able to uh, create his his own experience uh, and his own character sort of on the go. So we've seen uh, s some of these concepts applied in a, a game such as Hand of Fate, but where Hand of Fate uses the deck building mechanic to craft the actual game experience we are using the deck building mechanic to create the character that the user uh, uses. So that also means that it affects how he levels up throughout his uh, runs. Mm -hmm. That's great. So tell me about the game and what you want the player to experience. We want the player to have an experience where he he or she feels that it's always worth coming back. There's always new elements to explore. So in short, it's a roguelike with, uh, with deck building. And that basically means that every time you go to play the game, you will have the opportunity to experience something new. But in addition to that, we have also handcrafted uh, some campaigns because we wanted to utilize the content that we have to make sure that the player will have a smooth learning curve and that the that the content that you are exposed to sort of makes sense and opens up gradually. So when you've played through the campaign, you will have opportunities to keep on playing in more randomly generated content. Uh, and that's basically where the element of deck building is super awesome because it basically means that you can just keep returning to the game and always sort of find a new way to, to, uh, to approach the game. At, at this point, uh, I've experienced with a bunch of different uh, ways to, to play the game. You can make a very simple build where you just focus a lot on like damage and speed and um, blocking, like very basic uh, classic action elements. But you can also make some really crazy combo stuff where you can draw a million cards and deal a million damage. But that's, that's sort of... A, a risk and reward thing because if your combo doesn't get there well you might experience to be a bit underpowered in the later levels of the game so so the combination of these procedurally generated maps with the the cards really feels like something that creates uh, an experience that just keeps on opening up as you play it okay so when it came to promoting the game what strategies worked for your game and what didn't work so well? Well, <clears throat> essentially, I, th I think that we've been to some, um, to some conferences uh, a couple of times and these conferences have been great in the regard that it has been awesome to meet the community and interact with people playing it. But from a direct PR perspective, uh, the gain has probably been limited. Uh, it has meant that that some news outlet outlets has uh, written uh, a bit about it. But I think that what in general has worked very well for Beta Dwarf is this sort of very casual and and open approach to press. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> when we went to PAX East, instead of sending a, a long email about our game and what the features were, uh, Stefan, the CEO of uh, Beta Dwarf, just sent uh, an email where the first thing you, you'll see when you open the email is his face on a sort of funny background and there's just three lines about the game and uh, and then asking to, to meet up and, and come and, uh, and talk about the game. 
so we try to diverge a bit from the traditional, you know, wall of text PR um, strategies and instead try to be more casual because that's what fits our personality. Uh, I think we are sort of a very casual, laid back company. Also, it's probably like a very Scandinavian thing, I imagine, but um, we tend to have like a very ironic humor and stuff. We just made a, a trailer um, that we will release <clears throat> in the next couple of months, probably. And that trailer is sort of a spin-off of um, of old arcade, uh, Atari, and Nintendo games. Uh, those old trailers that were way over the top. I think we just find that it's usually a good approach to just be genuine uh, and don't be afraid to show that you have humor because if your game is good you don't really need to to write a a full story about it you just need to tell why it's awesome and and approach uh, the the press uh, on like on on a on a level where you're talking to them as if they they're humans and and I think that works really well, like just interacting uh, as as um, as equals. I think that there's probably a tendency to, to for people wanting the press to to write about the game so much that they they might come off like a bit needy, or they might find themselves at sort of a a, a lower level than the people they're approaching and I, I don't think that's a, a super healthy way of doing it mm -hmm. okay so I'm curious then how is it you went about getting feedback for the game and uh, QAing the game as well we've we've been selling um, we've been selling keys for the beta uh, sort of on the fly uh, it's we're taking it on and off depending on the stage of development we're in, but having our users uh, help us out with the QA and the general feedback of uh, of the game is super important to us. Uh, and a lot of people have helped us out, and we have gotten a million bug reports, and it's, it's just a tremendous resource to have and something that we're super grateful for um, because these things that gamers see are not necessarily something you see yourself when you're developing the, the game every day and you sort of have your head down in, in the mechanic. Um, and what we want to do is that, so we're launching a, a Kickstarter now and I think that by the time this go, goes uh, online, it might already be live, but one of the things that we want with the Kickstarter outside of actually get enough funds to, to finish the game is that rather than going to a publisher, having a Kickstarter community is something that is super awesome for getting feedback from users. Um, we had some experience with that from the first game that was funded through uh, Kickstarter as well. And I think that we... We want to use, utilize the users even more this time. We've gone into a completely open development where all users can go to our trailer board and follow the daily tasks and see what people are working on. They can also vote on the features that they uh, that they want to see implemented first. So we basically try to tell our community to to give their opinions as often as possible because it really is a, a super important uh, tool for us to make the game as good as possible. Mm -hmm. All right, so speaking of making games as good as possible, what was cut from the game and what was removed from the game and why? Oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really big question because the way we work is like we add a new feature every second week and then we remove it again. It's, I think this game has, it's, it's looked a million uh, ways. Um, and the way it is now is better than all of those because we kept adding and kept removing um, f 
for example, we had a period where um, where the mana wouldn't. Right now, the mana curve works the way that you're fighting through eight arenas, and on arena one you have one arena, on arena two you have uh, on arena one you have uh, one mana, or on arena two you have two, and, and so forth. And at some point, you could save mana between routes, uh, between rounds, and that really that that really destroyed the whole purpose of the deck building because you just put in the most powerful cards and then you play them. Whereas now you have to really focus on having a great curve. At some point, the game had boss fights where you had to fight against several bosses. We also removed that because we want to make each boss really interesting and we want the boss to be able to stand on its own. So that's a couple of examples of what has been removed. But as I said, we generally have this approach of adding a feature if we think it's great, trying it out, and if it turns out that it's not great, we just remove it again. And that's one of the benefits from having such an easy uh, um, feature implementation flow with the visual scripting that we're using. Um, but it's a blessing and a curse. It's Sometimes we end up doing a lot of extra work because we want to try out a feature that in the end doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So a trial and error. That's definitely, uh, that's definitely true, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so... What was the biggest thing that you learned uh, while working on the game? Yeah, I've learned a lot. Um, I think, I don't know, like, I, I think one of the things that that I've learned is something that I basically learn every time I work on a game, and it, it's just that communication between um between um, team members are so important <clears throat> and the communication of deadlines uh when they're supposed to be and when and why they're supposed to be met are super important i actually think that we've done a decent job uh this time i think the communication has been fairly good and fairly smooth but that's definitely one of the areas where there's always room for imp improvement especially uh Especially in a team with with twenty people, which I I consider a, f a fairly large indie development team. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was the biggest? Um, no, what was the worst thing that happened while you're working on the game, and how did you overcome it? The worst thing that happened didn't have anything to do with the game, but was unforeseen financial circumstances that really really set us back a lot um, our development time was cut with three or four months uh, so the whole planning that we had done was was sort of off and there isn't really anything specific we have done to overcome that obstacle other than having an impressively awesome team that hasn't really been affected by it, it's it's honestly quite impressive that people just keep on working with the same optimism because they think the game is awesome. So the fact that we sort of got hit in the face by some f financial circumstances didn't really knock people out. Um, and that's and that's definitely amazing and one of the things that I I think that is really awesome about being at a at a uh, at an indie developer because everyone there just loves making game and loves the company and loves developing this game so it, mm -hmm. it takes a lot for people to get knocked off their feet oh no doubt I understand that so I'm I'm curious then what uh... What game development related book, lecture or learning resource can you recommend? I'd recommend uh, really following uh, a lot of the uh, dev blogs on Gemma Sutra. Uh, I think that's an incredible resource, especially uh, their post-mortem section is really, really great. Just 
I think one of the most valuable things you can do is to read about other people's success and failures. And these are very real experiences. It's not, in theory, you should do A and B to get to C. It's, we mm -hmm. we did these things and it worked really well. And we also did these things and that was a huge mistake. Um, and sort of applying all these things to how your own development works is uh, is a huge resource. All right. So like in Evernote or Trello, do you have a useful or productivity enhancing app or website or extension worth sharing? For like workflow purposes or just in general? Both. I think we're, we're using Trello, Podio, um, Podio for sort of like an intranet and Trello for the... Uh, for the organization of tasks and Trello is just an amazing tool because we have a million tasks that we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, we just recently started to make the change from Skype to a new program called Slack, uh, which is, it's still in beta, so it has some quirks. But it's. I think when 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 they're done developing it, it will be a really great tool because it allows you to have a much better ongoing team communication, and you can save sort of threads. It works as a combination of a PHP forum and a Skype conversation, and that's just really awesome when you have a million different talks going on between a variety of groups. Mm hmm. Okay. So, Frederick. Frederick, what advice can you give to aspiring game developers, small indie studios, and people trying to get to where you are today? Just, just develop games. It sounds so, so as uh, such a stupid advice, but really don't overthink it. Just start developing games and start working with what you want to do. I think if you want to be an artist, you should draw a lot. If you want to be a game designer, design a lot, whether or not it's on pen and paper, or if you're able to make some apps, do that. And if you're a programmer, program a lot. And there are so many useful tools that you can download to to start getting into it. Uh, a tool like Game Maker, for example, is an incredibly simple simple way to to get started if you want to try uh, your hands on design. And, and I really think that the, the making games is just all about making games. You just have to do it and you just have to get your hands dirty. Uh, and then you have to believe in what you're doing. Uh, you have to have to think that your idea is awesome and then you have to follow it. And if your idea is awesome, surely you will be able to convince other people whether it, whether or not it will be like fellow developers joining uh, your team just out of the the passion, or whether or not it will be press outlets, but um, that that that's that's definitely the best advice I can give. I don't think you can read enough books to to get in a good place. You basically just have to to get uh, to get practical. Okay, I understand. That's great to know. So. What is next for you and what's the best way to contact you? Well, what's next for us is to see how the Kickstarter goes. Hopefully it goes really well. Uh, hopefully we gain a bunch of awesome uh, community members and hopefully uh, hopefully it makes it so that we're able to survive until our release dates. Uh, mm -hmm. That's definitely a super exciting period for us. So I'm really, uh, yeah, really excited to see how that goes. Uh, people can reach out to us on eternalarenas.com or uh, facebook.com uh, slash uh, forced um, and they can basically find all of our team members uh, on our um, team page on eternal arenas uh, and if they want to get in contact on on twitter they can do so uh, at the uh, Basically, my name, Frederick Denning, can also tweet to uh, at Baboonlord, who's the CEO and uh, super active on Twitter and always happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Well, Frederick, it appears we're out of time for this episode of the Daily Dev Talk. A lot of things to talk about, and remember, 
Slack is very useful as a trailer upcoming. Kickstarter is very useful for getting feedback and to continue the whole process of development. And a lot of things to remember and talk to talk about, like with a roguelike game that was with a with deck building, which is an interesting combination. And the Game of Sutra, the post mortem, has a lot of vital information. So I wish you well in future endeavors. Yeah, thanks. So stay tuned, Overload Nation. More more videos to come. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Data Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev. If you are a game developer that wants to get your name and game out there and to share your experiences and stories, or you have feedback or opinions of the show, then contact me at info at gameoverload.co.uk. That's info at gameoverload.co.uk. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode. More to come.